are delighted that you found time to come and celebrate with us open exploration, learning, growth, discovery, and tonight the Department of Religion and the Honors Program of Washington Adventist University have the pleasure to share with you the 35th Arthur G. Keir Lectureship, and uh, a, a very special one uh, that is devoted to a topic that brings different disciplines in conversation. And I would like at this time to invite Professor Brad Haas to introduce our very special guest. Good evening. Thank you so much for being here this evening. Uh, I know that we had some inclement weather earlier in the day. Fortunately, that has moved on. Uh, I'm Brad Haas, the director of the WU Honors Program, and I'm really glad that I'm able to partner with the Department of Religion for this special anniversary event. As most of you know, uh, today is October 22, 2014, which is the 170th anniversary of the Great Disappointment. Uh, I uh, wondered what we could do here on campus to kind of mark this auspicious occasion, especially as the Honors Program is, is celebrating its 10-year anniversary, and we're kind of thinking about cultural milestones. Uh, and as I mentioned this morning, uh, I work with Weiss Library and our Heritage Collection to put on an exhibition over in the library, which you'll have a chance to see later if you haven't already, uh, that kind of tells the story of the Great Disappointment and, and some of its legacies. Uh, so in thinking of that, I, I was wondering how we could uh, have a speaker who might be able to address some of the very um, special concerns uh, when it comes to material culture and spirituality. And I remembered uh, a course that I taught with Zach Plantech several times called Art and Adventism for the Honors Program. Uh, and we uh, read uh, several pieces by Dr. David Morgan. Uh, and I knew that he had done research in this area and I thought, I wonder if he would be available to do this. And I contacted him and he very graciously said, I would love to come up and speak on that occasion. Uh, Dr. Morgan is uh, currently the Chair of Religious Studies at Duke University. He also holds an appointment, as I understand, in the Art History Department. Uh, so he brings a unique interdisciplinary perspective to some of these objects that we're going to be discussing tonight. Uh, earlier today he spoke on the likeness of Christ, looking at how images of Christ have been formed and our relationship to them and how they form kind of our understanding of our own spirituality. Uh, and tonight we're going to be focusing more on something that is uh, appropriately attached to the Great Disappointment, namely the iconography that's used by the Millerite movement and in early Seventh-day Adventism. And I hope that this is going to be something that allows us to have a wider conversation and not to silo subjects like theology and art history and history into different departments, but to bring these things together and see them working holistically together. So I'm very excited to uh, have Dr. Morgan with us tonight. I'd like you to help me welcome him at this point. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brad. It's a delight to be here, especially on this occasion. I've uh, worked on Adventist history and the history of particularly Adventist imagery for 15 or 16 years now. I find it an incredibly interesting uh, field of research. I'm not Adventist, but I, I find, uh, I mean, I, my, my work has been devoted to the history of Protestantism and its imagery and art. And I'm uh, fascinated how Adventism fits into that history, a long history of several centuries. So it's a delight to be here tonight to think about your visual history. And uh, even maybe we can have some interesting explorations about uh, you know, what that history means uh, theologically, uh, intellectually, historically. It would be fun to, to do that. Uh, I titled this talk, The Look of Things to Come, as a kind of uh, irony because I'm an historian and uh, historians, like millenarians, uh, spend a lot of time looking backwards, not forwards. Actually, I think we spend more time looking backwards into time to figure out what's behind us in the future, as it were. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm going to, going to continue that, uh, that practice of what I like to call retrospection, looking behind in order 
in order to look ahead. Uh, if I can figure out, yeah. So let's look at uh, some of the material uh, that uh, will occupy our attention tonight. The Millerites were a, a group, I, 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 and I'll assume uh, that some of you don't know this, so I'll, I'll, I'll uh, probably bore some of you with material that you already know very well. Uh, please excuse me, but just to keep us all in the conversation, the Millerites were a group that followed the uh, uh, thinker, theologian, preacher, uh, William Miller, who had been a Baptist. Uh, actually, before that, he was a deist. And I want to talk about his own religious history, because I think it's very important in understanding the history of uh, Millerite and also Seventh-day Adventist uh, imagery. And he became uh, convinced in the course of extensive Bible study over the, 19, the 1820s and into the 1830s that it was possible, based on a very uh, excruciating, detailed uh, reading of several books of the Bible, but it, most importantly, the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, to conclude that Jesus would return about the year 1843. And he uh, developed, uh, helped develop a massive movement in the United States that uh, thousands of people became engaged in. And I'll talk a little bit about the uh, key importance of media in their project. They were aggressive users of media, inventors of media, extremely creative in their use of media. And in that regard, they shared a, a good deal with other Protestant groups. But I think if you think about the contributions of 19th century Adventism, to American religious history, the uh, ambitious and creative uh, use of media is one of them. Uh, all kinds of media in order to get the word out, in order, and not just to advertise and promote, but also to think about the message. Media become, are more than just bearers of information. I think in the case of Adventism, they are tools for understanding scripture and, make, and understanding biblical prophecy in particular. And I'm showing you some of these media. Uh, this, of course, is a, a very important chart. I'll talk more about it. Uh, produced by James White at the end of his life. And uh, Ellen White continued the cause. It was uh, published just a couple years after he died in 1883. And it was a large engraving. Um, this was uh, the work of the Millerites. Uh, it uh, occurred, uh, was published in about 1842. And uh, I'll talk about the relationship here. It's, it's a fascinating historical relationship. But this iconography, this set of imagery, was uh, uh, taken up by a variety of non adventists or people with their own version of the end of time and of reading and interpreting uh, biblical prophecy. For instance, the Jehovah's Witnesses. This was a, a tract given to me at my door one morning by a Jehovah's Witness. I was going to throw it away, but then I looked at it and said, wow, i got to keep that. Uh, <laughs> that's no right image. Uh, and indeed, the Jehovah's Witnesses learned a lot from the Seventh-day Adventists and from the Millerites in terms of bibli uh, representing biblical prophecy. They borrowed, sometimes wholesale, the iconography of the Adventists, and used it in their own interpretation of scripture, which of course is significantly different than uh, the Adventist tradition in many ways. Um, and also, it was very important to the dispensationalists, that group of people deeply influenced by Darby in Britain and by Cyrus Schofield in the United States, who felt that uh, God had organized time into seven major dispensations. and that plotting of finding ourselves in that map that God had ordained, foreordained, was a key uh, task to interpreting scripture properly and looking for the end of the time. And Clarence Larkin, who had been a civil engineer, and you will probably guess that by looking at this really uh, incredibly meticulous design, in Philadelphia, became uh, was a Baptist, became very interested in biblical prophecy and dispensationalism. He read the Schofield Bible religiously, and uh, 
dedicated himself to producing a number of books and charts uh, mapping out time. This one dedicated to the book of Revelation, uh, comparing Revelation and Daniel. And for that purpose, once again, he turned to the Millerites and the Seventh-day Adventists and lifted their material directly. And we see, uh, we can see it here, all the, the, the angels and the uh, creatures and the, the great man, all of these elements coming from 19th century tradition, Adventist tradition. So the, the Millerites were uh, extremely influential in their use of media and in the providing a kind of visual language for uh, Protestantism is in a much larger range of traditions and thought. Uh, down to this day, and I'll show you a couple latter day versions uh, later. But I want to start by saying that this way of thinking is actually quite old. Uh, Miller didn't invent it. He inherited aspects of it from the Christian past. And there is a, a long Christian tradition of taking biblical prophecy very seriously uh, in order to understand time and understand in particular God's use of time. Uh, I'm showing you a, a wonderful illustration from a manuscript uh, that was produced from the writings of Giacomo Fiora. He was an Italian uh, uh, theologian and monk who uh, became obsessed with thinking about biblical prophecy, and he was convinced that it was a key to understanding time and God's use of time uh, as a medium of self, of his revelation. And he produced this remarkable image here, which uh, is simultaneously uh, a symbol of the Trinity and a map of time, starting with Adam, you can see, and ending with the, the finis mundi, Latin for the end of the world. So we get both the relationship of God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. You can see Filios, uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Uh, one of the greatest mysteries of, uh, of, of, of Christian thought and belief. Uh, but it's also a way, according to Jacob of Fiora, of understanding God's plan from the beginning of history to the end. Um, he also was very interested in the book of Revelation and wrote extensively about it and had his work illustrated. This is the great red dragon of uh, Revelation 12. Um, and he, you can see that he, what I like about his work is he gives the image pride in place. You know, as an art historian, you should expect me to say that. The image drives the composition. He, he had the artist first create the image and then in the space left, he went and, and added the text. So the text has to bow to the priority of image. Uh, but it's a, it's a fascinating feature of his work because it tells us a lot about the tradition that was to come. And I think one of the most interesting uh, contributions, uh, I've mentioned the list already, of Millerism is its fascinating uh, use of image and text, integrating these two. Uh, people like to say Protestants don't do image and that's what Catholics do. Well, if you look at the history of Millerism, the history of Adamson, you know that's not true. Uh, images have a special place. And Miller and others talked about this. They said, uh, you, you know, those, those creatures in, in Daniel, those are not in, in discussed elsewhere in Scripture, in Revelation, in Ezekiel. Those are not symbols. They're not just abstract devices. The prophets really saw them. They were manifestations of God's will. They were visions. They weren't made up. They weren't dreams. They were visions of actual creatures seen through the mists of revelation. Uh, so that means imagery is serious. Uh, it, it's to be taken seriously, and it becomes a, a fundamental component in prophetic interpretation, uh, not an afterthought and not just another version of text. Text is serious, too. Obviously, scripture is in the tradition, the revelation of, of God's word. But the prophetic tradition gives place also to imagery. <coughs> this gets us a little bit closer to the uh, 19th century. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, chart image produced by a guy named Joseph Mead. 
he first produced it in, uh, well, he first wrote his Clavus Apocalyptica, the key to the Revelation, in Latin in 1627. The Puritan Parliament, which had taken over England, was so impressed by this in 1641-42, by this Latin treatise, uh, that they uh, ordered a translation of it into English, and they wanted it to be spread because they were convinced that he had a hit on, by his reading of the book of Revelation, a compelling reading of time that brought it down to the present and saw Puritan England, at least implied that Puritan England, was playing uh, an important role in God's millennial plan. So the Puritans looked at this and saw an eschatology that was friendly to their project. And they then uh, authorized the production of this, this manuscript. And the person who was uh, overseeing it was authorized to produce an image, uh, which is unusual. For the Puritans, of course, are more famous for going into Catholic uh, chapels and cathedrals in England and smashing the heads of Mary and destroying stained glass windows and scratching the eyes off of manuscript illustrations. Uh, you know, they've got a. Uh, an iconoclastic bent to them. But it's interesting that the very Puritan Parliament would authorize an image when it works in tandem with text. And uh, so to those who argue that Protestants don't do images, I always reply, it depends entirely on the context. When image and text work together, Protestants are very enthusiastic about them because they can recognize the power of images in thinking about scripture, in, in, in the case of Adventism, in thinking about the nature and the history of pro prophecy as a visual event, not just a visual event. And I want to say, uh, uh, I, I didn't mention this, uh, just to suggest a kind of, a, I'm not a theologian, but there's something interesting about uh, this fascination with time that I think is worth setting out. And I wanted to provide this sort of working definition. I'm delighted to have it, see it debated and, and thought about. What is prophetic temporality? I think the tradition of millennial thinking, millennial scriptural interpretation, millennial practice, has its own tradition of thinking about time that we can see at work in Adventist history in 19th century America. And that is, simply put, Prophetic temporality is a way of thinking about the organization of time as a providentially structured revelation of divine purpose moving toward the end of time. It's a lot to say. Uh, but the point is that time is, a, is the medium of God's prophetic self-expression and relation to mankind, humankind. That is, time is the way God realizes himself in the world, in, in time. Time becomes a medium for divine, as I say, self-expression. It's not indifferent, according to this mentality. Time is the special place you look to see God at work. And then the chart, I would argue, what I suggest here is, what are millennial charts? They're graphic devices or schematic diagrams, call them what you like that are tools for understanding the structure of prophecy as a temporal realization of divine purpose. So this purpose unfolds in time. Uh, and the chart is a device for capturing a, a, a clearer sense of that uh, and, and, and laying it plain. As Clarice Larkin said and, and Cyrus uh, Schofield and others, it's rightly dividing the word presenting it in clear terms that can be understood uh, as integrated scripture. And uh, really the granddaddy of, uh, the grandparent, I should say, of uh, <laughs> Adventist history in uh, undertaking this practice is the so-called 43 chart. It was actually produced in 1842, um, but it pulls together uh, years of William Miller's thinking, as well as the thinking of several of, of his colleagues, uh, integrating image, text, 
and uh, numeration to calculate here the return of Jesus in about the year 1843. Uh, originally, there were 300 of these charts. They're lithographs. They were black and white reproductions on cloth. They're about so tall. 300 were made in the summer, uh, ordered after an Adventist conference uh, in the Northeast in 1842. The first one was hand-painted by two clergy in the tradition. And uh, all those gathered, or many of those gathered there said, wow, this is what we need. This is going to help us get the word out. It's going to help us make clear what the Adventist message is. How do we take all these texts of scripture, these, these strange, mysterious images, and uh, the complex arithmetic, figuring all this out to make the message clear. Uh, so they ordered uh, 300 lithographs. As I said, they were produced in uh, black and white, but, and then they were hand painted. So all the color that you see on this was added after the prints. And these were taken on the road. Some of them have, as you can see at the top, they have uh, loops so that people would tack these up on steamships, uh, stagecoaches, walls, everywhere. Sometimes the tavern, because that's where a big audience could be found. And they would preach. They would preach the Adventist uh, interpretation of prophecy and work their way through this visual aid, starting up here, moving across, and moving down until they got to the final calculation. OK, you can get a sense of the orderliness, I think, of William Miller's thinking if you look very carefully at this, this systematic interpretation. Um, and indeed, he called the Bible, very deliberately, a feast of reason. The reason he said that <clears throat> was he was talking to folks like this. Tom Paine, famous American patriot, advocate of revolution, great enemy of Great Britain, uh, great American, but one who was uh, convinced that the Bible was a concoction of error and contradiction and should not be taken seriously. He was a outspoken critic of it. He was a deist, a, a believer that there was probably some God out there who created it all to begin with and then uh, went on to do other things. So the universe sort of ticked along, uh, but the Bible didn't have much to tell us about the origin and nature of that. That's according to Tom Paine. Miller, when he was a young man, was intrigued by deism and read Tom Paine, Ethan Allen, and a number of other uh, writers in this uh, way of thinking, and became more or less convinced, uh, at least for a short time, that they had something uh, to say. Uh, but then through a series of interesting uh, introspections and personal crises and prayer, um, uh, contemplating death, uh, he realized that he couldn't accept Deus God. But what bothered him most about deism was its critique of scripture, its hard-hitting critique. Uh, and he said there's got to be a way to respond to that critique, uh, to parry that thrust, so that we can be at ease with our reliance on Scripture as God's Word. So, in effect, I would argue he reversed the rhetoric. That he reversed the claim that Scripture was contradictory and, and full of errors, and argued, indeed, it is a feast of reason. God isn't a confused God. He, he says exactly what he means. He means what he says. It's there to be found. It's just incumbent upon the human reader to figure it out. And God wouldn't bother writing a book that couldn't be figured out. What would be the point, he said. So uh, he then takes on the deist tradition, as it were, head on, and says, I'm going to study prophetic scripture and determine this deep underlying reason in it and make that clear uh, to myself and then through preaching to others. And that's what, what he did. Uh, and the chart, I think, is uh, that I showed you is um, really a kind of crystallizing of that deep, deeply felt impulse to make sense of prophetic uh, tradition as, uh, as a, a revelation of God's organization of time and his work through time. There are a couple, of course, of 
broad philosophies of uh, the end and that were prevalent in the 19th century. The two schools were post-millennialism, which argued that uh, Jesus would reign over, uh, for a thousand years, reign over the earth, and it would be a time of peace and reconciliation and uh, ease and comfort and spiritual benefits. Um, and we have wonderful paintings from the 19th century that show from imagery drawing from the Hebrew Bible, uh, the lion lying down with the lamb, this symbolizing this time of prosperity and peace. Uh, and Indians, uh, Native Americans, and Anglos would become come at peace with one another, war would cease, the world would be transformed by God's blessing. That was the post millennialist view. And I think if you know something about American character, you can understand why that would be appealing. Americans have always been optimists. They always, they've always believed in rolling up their shirt sleeves, solving their problems, and you know, setting the world up. And that they can create through economic incentives, through hard work, through the application of science, technology, whatever, they can create a better world. Um, Americans have that reputation, and I think it's a deep part of their uh, national psyche. Optimism. So post-millennialism post certainly appealed to that sensibility uh, for many people. And for many people in the 19th century, when they looked at the uh, advance of, the, of industrialization, the steam engine, uh, you know, the uh, flourishing of the American Republic, they said, see, these are signs that God has blessed us and that the great golden age has begun, the, the thousand years of peace has begun. And America is going to play a very special role in that. This is another deep American uh, assumption. It's with us today, I think, the, the sense that we are a nation set apart. We have a special mission. We are exceptional. We have a special place to play in the divine drama uh, appointed by, by God. So post-millennialism appealed to them. The other version, and this is where uh, Millerism uh, fits, was premillennialist that said the, things are going to end violently and it's going to happen soon. Um, and it uh, takes a, uh, a less rosy view of the future uh, and predicts on the basis of its reading of scripture that uh, things are uh, winding down quickly and that God will uh, bring the end of time to a uh, a horrific conclusion uh, after the second coming of Jesus. And we can see, this is, I just pulled off from that, another uh, version of this, and there are uh, much more violent versions of it that uh, show this uh, end time, uh, this version of it happening. I'll come back to more of that in a minute. Um, this is an example of a post millennialist sensibility. This was produced in 1845. It's called Christian Union. It's, a, it's a, an important image to look at as we think about the mainstream Protestant response to Millerism when the day of great disappointment happened. Uh, because what we see here, in effect, are the enemies, the enemies of Millerism, the enemies of early Adventism. These are Anglicans, uh, Presbyterians, a Methodist or two, uh, different kinds of Calvinist tradition represented, uh, maybe a Lutheran, not sure, uh, Quaker, Evangelical Quaker. These were the, the mainstream, more or less, of American Protestantism that reacted uh, vehemently against Millerism and were very critical of it in the press. And uh, that's an important thing to note because it has a lot to do with the, early, with the response of early Seventh-day Adventism to the Great Disappointment, and more importantly, to the society. But I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people missing from this. No Catholics, no Mormons. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you notice the only time African Americans show up is it, here, <laughs> the slave being freed, or the Native American here. It's a white colloquy. It's a white group, white male group, 
uh, largely shaped by the Calvinist tradition. Uh, so it a, has a, a great theological focus and specificity. Uh, and these are the people who claim special status in the great American dispensation, as they imagined it happening. The Millerites um, came from a lot of different traditions, uh, Baptist, Calvinist, Methodist. Uh, and uh, when they read Miller's work or heard him or uh, other Millerite preachers uh, present their interpretation of prophecy, uh, thousands were uh, taken by the idea and felt it was quite convincing. It helped very much that Joshua Himes, sort of the right-hand man of, of William Miller, was a brilliant publicist. He was a, uh, had been long committed to social and moral reform. He knew how to get the word out. He knew how to engage people in a complex job. He knew how to deal with media very effectively. Uh, he was a publisher of great skill. He set up a, a couple of very important newspapers, the Midnight Cry, and just before it, Signs of the Times. These uh, quickly achieved very large circulation and were effective instruments. He produced, this is actually something he uh, issued, uh, it was uh, stationary. So every letter that he would write, of course, the, this is the day before the typewriter, everything that was handwritten was written on stationary like that. So he did not miss an opportunity to teach Adventist doctrine, to teach uh, Millerite uh, cause. Uh, and of course, there is the chart, which was novel, which lots of people, non Adventists, remarked on. They, they, it, it was, uh, they were struck by it. It was spectacular, it was strange, it was exotic. Uh, they wanted to understand it. I think as a piece of visual rhetoric, it's very clever. Because you look at this and you instantly ask yourself, and uh, as a visual communicator, when you can get that done, that's 90% that's of the job. You've hooked someone. You, they want to know what's going on here. And the chart worked marvelously at that. Uh, and the Millerite preachers were very good at un unfurling the chart in everyday circumstances and securing uh, an audience. They were also very good at uh, publicity and creating um, itinerant moments for preaching and gathering. And they used a very large tent. The Millerite movement was unfolding in the midst of what historians call the Second Great Awakening, which was a uh, broad uh, and very uh, emotional spread of revivalist Christianity um, throughout the Union uh, at the time, in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s. And Miller's a, was part and parcel of that. So it was a part of a, a moment in American life when people were interested in new ideas. They wanted to hear these new religious interpretations. It was the moment when Mormonism was born, uh, Seventh-day Adventism, Millerism, a, a variety of Protestant organizations that, uh, many of which made effective use of media and seized on public opportunities to present themselves and attract public attention. However, uh, Jesus decided not to show up uh, in 1843. It was, of course, dramatic. Uh, so they did some recalculating, and the group felt that they had missed some important uh, information in their reading of scripture. So they um, reforecast and said it's probably going to be about around October 22nd, sometime later in the fall, the next year. And uh, for the second time, Jesus uh, did not show himself in the, in the second coming. And that is then the date that Adventism has remembered as the great disappointment, because they were deeply, deeply invested in their interpretation of prophecy and could not begin to understand if indeed the Bible is a piece of reason and Miller had correctly understood it, why didn't Jesus come? Um, was our theology wrong? Have we goofed this up? Have we offended God? Is God punishing us? Why has he done this to us? Why did he set us up and then knock the feet out from under us? Uh, what happened? It was a deep spiritual crisis. What do you do when God doesn't 
do what you expect them to do. This is not uh, an unusual situation. Uh, people face this all the time. But health problems, wars, famines, etc. How to make sense of disaster. Young Ellen White and James White had been very young, I think, teenagers during the movement and uh, were uh, themselves among the great disappointed. Um, and over the next many years, gathered uh, largely secretly to talk about this, to pray about this, to think this through, to recalculate, to go over their interpretations of scripture, and try to figure out what, what went wrong. Um, if, while they were doing that, the Millerite cause was suffering enormous uh, ridicule in the press. Uh, the Protestant majority that I mentioned, the Calvinists and the Methodists and some of them, didn't spare the ridicule. They published their, uh, uh, they published plays, illustrations, short stories, uh, fictitious dialogues, all kinds of things in the press, issued uh, uh, for a long time to come, issued uh, cartoons making fun of the Millerites uh, standing on uh, rooftops dressed in bed sheets waiting for Jesus. Um, then, then sort of uh, uh, fantastic visions here of a chapel being taken up into the heaven. And, uh, they took the very iconography, the imagery, and turned it around to make fun of the Millerites. This was a caricature of Miller himself. He had, uh, saying he had hidden himself in a Millerite, not necessarily really Miller, in a uh, small enclosure with food. Uh, hiding, uh, waiting for the second coming, or hiding from the reality when it didn't happen. This was the kind of abuse that um, small faithful had to endure. And uh, they were written up in the leading newspapers of the time and ridiculed just wholesale. It, was a, it would have been a very tough, tough time uh, to be a, uh, a former Millerite. But as you may know, they uh, persevered thought uh, deeply about this and hit on a number of uh, novel uh, theological reflections and ideas that helped them begin to make sense of this. And they continued to debate these ideas of, uh, over the course of many years. But of course, the idea of the sanctuary, of Jesus uh, enter, not coming back in the, second, uh, in the second coming on October 22nd, but advancing into the inner sanctuary to prepare to come back soon. They learned, they decided we're not going to set any more dates. We're not going to say that. We know what can happen when we do that. But we do feel that because Jesus has gone into the inner sanctuary to prepare, it's going to come soon. We don't know when it's going to come soon. Uh, this was an interesting doctrine, widely debated. Uh, it, it did help people uh, in a profound way uh, negotiate the great disappointment. And it then became, you might say psychologically as well as theologically, the basis for rethinking their organization as a group and looking to the future uh, in a much brighter way than they had experienced in the wake of October 22nd. Um, and in a few years, a new round of charts started to emerge. And I want to show you a couple of those. This is by Cecil Rhodes, published in 1850. You can see that it's based on the Millerite chart, clearly. Uh, Ellen White and others were, became convinced that, in fact, Miller had it right in terms of his basic calculus, his interpretation. He wasn't, he wasn't wrong. They went over, as you can imagine, they spent years pouring over this and going over and over and over to make sure that they understood it clearly. So the new chart is very, very similar. Uh, there are, however, some really interesting changes. Um, this guy here is uh, both a reference to the papacy, uh, but also a reference, you can't see it, but it says here, to republicanism. Republicanism is the code language for uh, our favorite young democracy, right, in the United States, and Protestantism i.e. all those folks who have been kicking us around for the last few years and 
have failed to understand what it is we're teaching. So there's a new sense of the competition, you might say. There's a problem out here we're facing. We're, pro we're facing a, 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 a nation that has a post-millennialist perspective and has a very different understanding of time and of God's relationship to it. And there are a bunch of Calvinists and Methodists uh, who don't really understand, who can't understand what it is we're arguing about prophecy. So uh, that becomes a, clearly a minor feature when you look at the whole thing, but it's there. It wasn't there in the Millerite. They didn't have that sensibility. Miller wanted very much uh, to keep his project at peace with all the other churches. He felt that this was a doctrine everybody ought to share and embrace. So it was a, it was a very non-sectarian project in Miller's mind. But after the Great Disappointment, it was a polarizing event. It became a kind of pivotal moment in the history. And, and Seventh-day Adventism emerges on the other side with a different sensibility, having been hammered by uh, a very hostile uh, public uh, reception. James White loved this chart, and so did Ellen. Uh, they felt, wow, this is exciting. This is a new uh, beginning. Uh, we can affirm what we firmly believe about Miller's uh, reading of scripture, and we can now look ahead. And they came to understand the message of the third angel as really important as orienting them toward the future, waiting, looking for Christ's return, but not setting a date. Uh, and there was a lot of discussion about the three angels here uh, of Revelation. It's very interesting. The first angel sometimes was understood in terms of Miller's uh, uh, production. The second angel uh, referred to the uh, 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 disappointment and to the end times. And the third angel referred to um, the... Uh, the mystery of how of looking to the future and of waiting, uh, the special message of uh, anticipating now the end. Um, they, and these were variously debated, uh, and I'm sure some of you may know more about those interpretations than I do. The, the charts became what's really interesting, and in Adam just thought they became um, sometimes contentious. They became objects over which people argued. And Ellen White became very involved, as did James, in um, vetting the charts and saying, no, that one's inappropriate, that one is not revealed from God, that one lacks a spiritual authority, this one does this one God has told me, I've seen, is a problem. So the charts become important, you might say, ecclesiastic events in the formation of the Adventist community. James White became very enthusiastic about chart production. He was a, a kind of a, another version of Joshua Hines for the Millerites. He, he took publication and media production very seriously. Spent a lot of time, uh, devoted a lot of his time, and spent a lot of money on this uh, to uh, create charts that would effectively present Adam's doctrine, but also he found serve as a kind of uh, galvanizing feature or device. It would bring the Adventists together. It would become the basis for recognizing their center of gravity and creating a kind of polity. This is, this is where we are. Uh, you can see now that the, the, if you go back, uh, there's a cross here that's really, really tiny, very, very small. Jesus takes his place within a much bigger economy of God's prophetic work. Uh, the whites had, uh, I would argue, a more Christological understanding of Jesus' role. And you can see then the chart, or the cross rather, starts to take on more prominence. You can track this through uh, the series of charts. Um, what I find interesting about this chart is James White decided that all that text, it was uh, time to just quietly retire it and focus on image. So we, you know, I showed you the Yacht and Fiori, which you have image and text. By the time 1863, of course, the important year where the church is founded, uh, we have some text, names basically, but uh, James White felt that the images themselves had the power, the graphic power to convey the idea. So we get a chart here that's basically image. And one of the reasons he did that is he knew what kind of competition he was up against. 
He was competing with Courier and Ives, uh, which was a powerful lithographic firm based in New York City that produced thousands and thousands and thousands of lithographs for the American home. And uh, that fact was not missed by James White. He realized uh, that uh, the Courier and Ives and other lithography producers were on to something. The American home was now seen as a very special place. It was seen as a place to decorate for the sake of raising children and becoming uh, the parlor. I don't know if you know this, the parlor came into existence in the 19th century, as we understand it today. It became the, the public face of the home. It's the place where you play games with your kids. It's where you raised your children. It's where you entertained guests. Uh, and the parlor then was needed to be decorated in an appropriately Christian way. And Courier and Ives produced uh, a lot of religious images, both Catholic and Protestant in nature. James White said, why shouldn't Adventists be exactly the same? So he wanted to produce a series of charts that would go in the home, not just be homiletic devices for the road, for preaching, but also domestic decoration. Uh, and he felt then that I think the image role of the chart became especially attractive because he knew it would appeal to children, even children who couldn't read. So the images would have a presence on the wall and enter into domestic life in the Adventist home. And of course, when he looked at what the uh, competition was doing, there was reason to be very ambitious about this because he had to compete with uh, a variety of this is by Courier and Ives. Uh, they did a lot of that sort of thing. Other uh, litho producers would do this. And this is, this is rather similar to his chart, perhaps a bit more text, but lots of images uh, that are fun to look at, fun to figure out. You can imagine 19th century kids having fun with that kind of thing in the home. Well, in the 70s, in the 1870s, an important transformation Merritt Gardner Kellogg of Kellogg Adventist fame um, produced this chart. And basically what he did is he took the one I just showed you, the very flat schematic set of prophetic images, and he put it into three dimensions. Uh, and he did that under the influence, again, I think, of uh, Courier and Ives and the big litho, the taste for lithographs in American life. Uh, which was, you know, like to do landscapes and show the world beautiful scenes of nature. And he said, why can't we do basically the same thing? We can take all those key moments in prophetic history and unfold them in a kind of tableau. Uh, the expulsion of Adam and Eve from Eden, the uh, death of, of uh, Abel, uh, the sacrifice of Noah and through, uh, through Jesus, uh, the Last Supper, uh, baptism, and then on the way, the second coming of Jesus here, and the kingdom of heaven unfolding and coming at the end of time. So you get this sort of three-dimensional engagement of uh, Adventist teaching. And when James White saw this, he was uh, very struck by it. He, he liked the idea very much. But he found a few things problematic. Uh, I just want to show you, he then, uh, a couple years later, issued his version, basically, of this, but uh, freed of a couple of features that he probably found, uh, uh, as they say, problematic. Um, one of them was this uh, I have God. Yeah. Uh, he didn't like that I have God. I, I, I couldn't find, I, I, I spent a lot of time at Andrews University going through the archives looking for his correspondence because I wanted to know if I could, what, what his issues with this Merrick Gardner Kellogg image. What, 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 how, why did he find it necessary to edit it? But unfortunately, I couldn't you know, find the smoking gun, as it were. Um, so I had to guess. And this is a guess. I could, I could be wrong. But one of the prominent pieces of uh, popular iconography in the 19th century were Masonic charts. There was an enormous industry. They were lithographed. And in the 1870s, it's been estimated by social historians one in five American men belong to a Masonic order. Mm -hmm. One fifth, 20% of the population, that's enormous, uh, enormous. Probably more men than go to church on set for, for a lot of Protestant traditions. 
were, were members in good standing in any one of many different Masonic uh, lodges. So that meant there were a lot of uh, people buying these kinds of charts and displaying them in their homes or at the, at the lodge. And uh, uh, always a prominent feature, almost <coughs> always, is the eye of God right at the top. Uh, and I've asked Adventist colleagues of mine, what's, what's your tradition's attitude toward lodges? And the answer I usually get is, eh, we don't feel very good about lodges. It's, it's not good for a while. Um, Protestant groups have very different ideas. I know the Lutherans and the Catholic Catholics, Protestant, the Lutherans and Catholics are strongly opposed to lodges. Methodists aren't. Methodists commonly belong. Uh, so I gather that, although I didn't find, is there a doctrinal statement in the church about lodge? Uh, I, if there is, I didn't find it. But I think as a practice, there's, uh, it's, it's something that generally it has, it hasn't been done by, by Adventists. Uh, so that may be one reason why he wanted to lift that out and he didn't like the association. Um, and uh, what else? Um, here is his version. So he simply eliminates the eye of God here. Um, he uh, gets rid of the second coming of Jesus. It may have made him a little nervous because it would suggest an imminent time, and he didn't want to go down that route. We certainly get, you know, the celestial Jerusalem, the kingdom of God, unfolding there on the edge, of the horizon of the present, ready, and we wait for it as he would teach. But we don't see Jesus lighting in on a cloud because that might send the wrong message and then get us into the time setting scenario again. Um, otherwise, things are very, very similar uh, to, to the, the gardener. This uh, was, a, a, once again, a lithograph. The cross is fascinating. Um, here's the corpus. It's not just now a uh, barren cross, as it was in the rose. It's uh, the full corpus of Jesus. And look at this. Notice the, the uh, shadow. The shadow stretching back through time. Uh, it's a very interesting thing. So time is running this way, but the light of God is going this way. Uh, it's fascinating uh, detail to think about. Um, this Once again, this special Adventist consciousness of time uh, as a medium for divine revelation. Well, that one uh, sold well. People liked it. I, I, I tracked its uh, reception uh, when I went through the Review and Herald history. Um, but he wasn't uh, satisfied. And he looked around at, at, at contemporary visual culture and said, we can do better. The church can do better. Uh, and he started to think about a new image, an image which would turn a lot of corners. And he identified Thomas Moran, who was a very uh, famous, well-known landscape painter in America uh, in the second half of the 19th century. And he began a correspondence with him and said, I'd really like to hire you to create this engraving. It was no longer going to be a lithograph, but a, a highly produced, very expensively produced engraving, which was a much more involved process. And uh, Moran finally agreed. I think he got paid 300 bucks. Mm -hmm. And he produced uh, an elaborate drawing. And then the drawing was engraved by technicians. And this was the result. Uh, White died, as I mentioned earlier, before it could be finally issued. But Ellen picked up uh, uh, the project. And in 1883, the way of life uh, appeared. And it's remarkable for many reasons. Uh, the level of workmanship is certainly higher. It's a much moodier, more visually engaging image, I think. Uh, it's, uh, the, the panorama is dramatic. We get this really wonderful, almost uh, Milton-esque uh, image of the kingdom of God in the, in the clouds advancing slowly. Uh, and perhaps most amazingly, Look at the prominence of the crucified Jesus. Uh, he, go, he goes from 1850 being a tiny little detail in the Rhodes chart to being front and center 
uh, by 1883. So think about, if, if, if you want to interpret this, as I've tried to do, as a theological shift in the church, is happening in just the course of 33 years. Uh, Jesus is not just a detail in a prophetic history. He is now front of us. He is the fulcrum of human history, of, of God's creation. Uh, and his sacrifice is, is, uh, is of great sacramental significance. So this is the, uh, the, the, the great cosmic drama that produces reconciliation between man and mankind and, and the divine. Uh, so it's uh, remarkable that we have all of the other details. They're all still there. Uh, still, they haven't left those behind, but it's a, a different kind of dramaturgy, you might say. It's a different kind of arrangement with charged with uh, a new theological emphasis, which was not well received by some Adventists, uh, who, who took this as a, a turn from the tradition that they had committed themselves to. So there were years of interesting theological debate about this. But I think it's, uh, I would say, that Ellen White's perception, she got squarely behind this image. And it, it, it became a kind of emblem of this theological debate and supported it. I just wanted to show you, uh, once again, a contemporary uh, uh, image. This is of uh, uh, Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, a late 17th century Puritan production with an uh, allegorical novel, which was perhaps some of you read, have read, enormously important for the history of uh, English and American Protestantism. Probably, second to the Bible, the most important book that was ever published, I right think. Uh, and it, was, it continued to be very popular in the 19th century. This was produced in 1853, but there are other versions produced later, and some going back to about 1801. It shows the entire book in this panoramic setting. We, we start here and we follow uh, through this elaborate landscape all the way up to the celestial Jerusalem uh, at the end of Christian and Christiana's journey through time. Uh, so it's an interesting Puritan uh, thought about time, the, the, the pilgrimage of life, uh, and making one's way faithfully to the end. I think when you look at this kind of elaborate engraving, uh, it's the sort of thing that James and Ellen White uh, might have had in mind when they, when they hit on this kind of an image. They really wanted to take the church into uh, a visual conversation with the culture, I think, in a way that would be engaging. They didn't want to look uh, folk art. They wanted to look sophisticated. They wanted to speak the language of fine art. So that's why they went to Thomas Moran, a very accomplished and very important American artist. And paid up, but at the time would have been a lot of money to have him produce uh, his image. Uh, and I think it was a way of charging their new theological emphasis on the significance of Jesus uh, in this economy. So that brings us to the end. Uh, I wanted to end here just to uh, look ahead once again uh, and emphasize the past and the, the, the legacy, something of the legacy, showing you here a, a page from the Schofield Bible. Uh, and I think Adventism contributed very interestingly to, a, 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 to the history of reading scripture and making sense of it. And reading it, in a sense, very creatively. Um, sort of reading it, and nowadays we, we, we talk about hypertexts, that is, reading of texts that are not linear from beginning to end, but reading them through and in terms of other texts, creating a sort of network uh, of connections rather than a simple linear thing. And I think Adventism helped teach Americans how to think that way. Because from the beginning, you didn't start with Genesis and simply read to the end of Revelation. You read here, then you went there, and then you went back there. All parts of scripture were engaging one another simultaneously in a complex, a symphony, a symphonic conversation. And that is how Adventism makes sense of prophecy. And I think uh, later, uh, Schofield reference Bible does that, dispensationalism based on, uh, Schofield does that by borrowing Adventist imagery. The Church of God lifted Adventist imagery in its early, late 19th, early 20th century ministries. Uh, this is a chart produced uh, 
in the early 20th century and used by Church of God preachers, uh, you, you can see elements that are taken directly from Adventist history. So it's a, it's a fascinating theological, visual tradition that has, I think, still a legacy uh, today in uh, imagery that's still very much among us. Thank you. to kind of uh, let you know what's going to happen uh, next, as is the tradition of the Keo lectures, uh, we have some respondents. Uh, I've asked three people to give uh, short responses, uh, uh, and then I, we, I promise you there will be some discussion, and then there will be some food over in the library. So if you, if you stick it out, uh, I, I promise we'll give you some sustenance. Um, so I, I want to introduce the three respondents, and, and I would invite them then in turn to come up and give their responses, and then we'll open it up to the floor to uh, engage with some of the thoughts that have been presented. Uh, I, I, I have to, forgive me for, for saying this, Doug, uh, years ago when I first became interested in Adventist material culture, and I was coming from literary modernism, and I was studying uh, about um, you know, the publishing of, of literary modernism, I said, you know, a lot of this seems to make sense within the Adventist heritage. I said, well, has anybody done any research on this? And I, I looked it up, and I found uh, that Morgan had written about this, and it was somebody named D. Morgan. And I said, I need to call Doug about this. We have to have a talk. And it turned out to be David Morgan. Uh, and and uh, I think it's a reasonable uh, a response, because we have our own expert here at, at WAU, uh, Professor Doug Morgan, not to be confused with David Morgan, and he's our uh, illustrious colleague who has done a, a lot of wonderful research uh, in, on Adventist history, so I, I wanted to make sure that he had a chance to respond tonight. Also, Dr. Ingrid Stottlemyer. Uh, Ingrid is a, a, a very interesting person. I, I had the, the pleasure to meet her this summer. Uh, she is a graduate of Atlantic Union College and a participant in their honors program, uh, but she is also currently teaching at uh, the University of Maryland, their honors college. So she's providing, a, a, I think that she embodies from my discussions with her <coughs> the interdisciplinarity uh, that we are trying to achieve here. And while she has uh, studied literature, she's also very interested in 19th century material culture, so I think that she's going to bring an interesting perspective. And last but not least uh, is Konstantin Kulikov. Uh, now, Konstantin is uh, a, a younger voice that I wanted to have uh, bring some uh, uh, interjections here. Uh, he is a graduate of WAU, and he also participated in the honors program, who's an English major. Uh, he is a practicing poet. Uh, he also uh, studied the philosophy of religion and is now sitting at Union Theological Seminary. So I thought that he would bring an interesting kind of uh, perspective. And also I should mention that he did take art and Adventism and has uh, read and engaged with Professor Morgan's work. So I, I wanted to make sure that we had a variety of voices here. So this time I'd like to invite uh, Doug Morgan uh, for his response. indeed a, a privilege to uh, make the acquaintance of Professor David Morgan from time to time at academic conferences uh, introduced to someone and they say, oh, you wrote that great uh, study of Warner Solomon's End of Christ. And, um, you know, I, I think I have to confess that there may have been a time or two when it was clearly just a passing encounter that I just sort of let it go. <laughs> Enjoy the moment of, of, of accolade. Um, but uh, I do want to thank you, and I think that uh, all of us uh, who are connected with uh, Adventism owe uh, Professor David Morgan a huge uh, debt of gratitude because of the way in which he has gone in such depth and um, moved with such finesse through very um, complex material and uh, it breathes some life and excitement, I think, into a topic that uh, many, perhaps, uh, uh, more educated, sophisticated Adventists today uh, are somewhat embarrassed about and would uh, rather uh, not talk about too much. But I think that uh, uh, this uh, is uh, a wonderful way for us uh, to think about these things from an additional and enriching angle. I would like to make just uh, two 
observations. I, I think that uh, that, that uh, will be it. And the first one is simply that I am struck by uh, the way in which we see Adventists um, innovating in the use of imagery and uh, the, the entrepreneurship and uh, combined with, uh, I will say, I, I have a much greater appreciation for kind of the uh, artistic or aesthetic sensibilities of a man like Himes and White, which I didn't, you know, I just didn't really think about before. But that uh, innovation and uh, a, a aggressive use of imagery uh, for the purpose of challenging and subverting uh, the dominant culture, if you, if you will, a challenge to American exceptionalism. But yet, at the same time, there is the evangelistic uh, missionary purpose, if you will, to try to be winsome. So we find uh, James White, uh, uh, I think this uh, was not mentioned in the talk, but in your, in your book you mentioned how uh, with the uh, way of Christ he had well, one version for the people who practiced baptizing, baptism by immersion and another uh, version for the sprinklers. Yeah. Because while it is a uh, effort to uh, present uh, the uh, Adventist message uh, in a, a compelling way, which is a very oppositional message to uh, the prevailing culture, uh, it is also uh, has that effort to connect with the larger culture. And, uh, well, this is another point, but uh, I won't go in depth, but just on the side, uh, uh, it strikes me also the extent to which Adventists influence others, I think, was, is new to me. Uh, but the other uh, main uh, thought that I had, um, I, this may raise some questions, and I think probably might be uh, something that, that uh, uh, others uh, in this circle might find um, a little surprising, perhaps, or uh, not too congenial to their uh, thinking. Uh, shouldn't have, uh, try to set it up in that way. But anyway, uh, here we go. Um, and that is the, uh, the, the transition from the schematic chart to the pictorial. Um, starts off with, with at Merritt G. Kellogg, and it's very much a uh, depiction of the sweep of the uh, story of salvation. Okay, and I sort of connected this with, in, with, in a sense, a broadening of the Adventist sense of placement in history. It, we had the third angel's message, okay, this is the last one, we've got it charted out. But the great controversy story, which comes along a little later, gets more fully elaborated, um, put, gives a broader frame for a placement in history. And uh, I think that's a, an advance. Now, here's the part that I think it may be controversial. I think most, I mean, conjecture that most Adventists today would say, you know, hey, it's great that the cross of Christ came to be the dominating center of the final version of, of the way of life. Here's my question. Uh, I wonder, though, that if that process might have set in motion a loss of the narrative uh, sense of theology in, 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 in the, uh, and that we are in this great story that has uh, in which Christ has a richer significance than just a substitutionary atonement which that great dominant image of the cross suggests that uh, is something that uh, may, again, go against the grain, but it occurred to me 
uh, as a question. Well, that uh, was my second point. I guess I, in search of a conclusion to my remarks, I will just mention uh, a third very briefly without going into it, and that is that uh, I recently did uh, a little uh, work on uh, Millerism in relation to the abolitionist movement, and uh, I found a book by a man by the name of Scott Gap about the Hutchinson family singers who were the great troubadours of uh, uh, freedom. The, uh, Pete Seeger, Peter, Paul, and Mary, you two, I don't know uh, who to compare them with uh, today, of that movement. And the connections there between the, just the musical qualities of the Millerite uh, songs and um, how the Hutchinson family singers appropriated them with such success, mainly the form of the music, but there's a little bit of content overlap as well, just suggested to me that there's another aesthetic dimension that might be worth exploring sometime. But uh, anyway, that concludes my remarks. Again, with much gratitude, Professor David. for another very interesting talk. Those of you who had the pleasure of hearing him speak this morning, um, it's really been uh, wonderful to have these images set out before us and to have the questions that they raise um, stimulating our thoughts as well. And um, as grounded as your subject is in an earlier historical period, and specifically in the 19th century, I was struck constantly in reading your material beforehand and listening to you speak today. Um, about how relevant this material is for contemporary Adventist culture as well. Um, in the history that you lay out in the early roots of Adventism, we might consider as well how contemporary Adventists view popular culture and mass media, and how Adventist culture upholds certain models of reading and even a unique, we might say, aesthetic uh, tradition. It's a fascinating subject to bring to this campus, and it's a privilege to be here today and to um, have a small part in this conversation. So I have three issues that I'd like to raise today in response to your talk, and also in connection to Protestants and Pictures, which is the 1999 book that um, the talk material comes from, and which I really highly recommend for those who haven't looked at it yet. Um, it includes, of course, this close consideration of visual images among Millerites and early Adventists, and all of them are concerned of my questions. In some way, with the three images that you explore in your chapter on Adventism, the way of life from paradise lost to paradise restored, and this is, of course, the three images that ends with the Thomas Moran image, um, the first one being the Marriage Gardner Kellogg image, and then the second one being James White's revision to it, and then this third one that was commissioned um, by James White. Um, first, I'd like to just actually, and, and all of these are really kind of just set out as some brief thoughts and some questions maybe for some further speculation in connection to these issues. So first, I'd like to just consider very briefly and broadly some questions of historical context. Um, your book sets up the cultural and historical context for the Millerite and early Adventist production of the charts and pious images. And then um, Doug Morgan, I believe, who just spoke. Uh, was mentioning, for instance, connections between abolitionism, possibly, that might be connected to early Adventist culture as well. Um, I found myself thinking about things like the developments of transportation, um, the transportation infrastructure in 19th century America, the canal system, the railroads, you know, what we think of as maybe the early highways in this country, um, also the publishing technologies that drove forward the era's print culture, um, the increase in immigration um, in the country in the 19th century, and particularly was noted groups of uh, large groups of Catholics coming to the country, um, increased urbanization, industrialization, uh, the national push westward under the uh, doctrine of the manifest destiny, and correspondingly um, the indigenous uh, population being exterminated or converted or cordoned off um, into certain sections of the country. And also I thought about scientific developments of the period, um, uh, geologists like Charles Lyell, um, biologists such as Charles Darwin, all challenging biblically-based understanding of, understandings of time and space. And you raise a lot of these issues kind of at least below the surface, I think, and establish them as important for these images um, in your book. 
Um, very briefly, though, just one that really caught my mind in particular was the idea of the uh, urbanization of America, the growing sense of cities in the country, and what their place was. And I was thinking of them particularly in connection to these three images um, that we saw being transformed from the early Kellogg image through the Moran image. And I wondered, um, they were such an interesting group of texts to look at. They certainly, of course, echo John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress and the idea of moving um, toward the city. Uh, but also, there's something, um, you talk about there becomes something moves from expository to devotional. Uh, but also, when we think about the city, what happens to it in these images? And if we were to go through them from the 1873 to the 1876 to the 1883 image, um, they're all very strikingly present in terms of having the city there. And unlike popular, you know, we would have a kind of spread of popular literature at the time that would warn people away from the city. Um, we would also, however, have a growing sense of travel guides that were being published during this time and people actually being lured into the city in a lot of ways. And I was curious about things such as the first image being dated in 1873, of course, would come two years after much of Chicago had burned down. And after some people were approaching the task of rebuilding the city as almost the idea that we could get the city right this time. Um, so in a very loose way, um, other connections that come to my mind are uh, questions about manifest, manifest destiny, how that, that idea might play out in some of these images that have such a striking sense of a broad and large landscape in them. Um, questions about how the city maybe would have played into fears, but also maybe some optimism for people at the time. And it's always depicted as this kind of glowing, uh, beautiful image and something for people to aspire to and to go to. Uh, so I was partly just interested in how maybe some, some of the big changes that were happening in America, on America's landscape at the time might have been playing out as a subtext in some of these images as well. So that's the first point briefly. Um, secondly, I'm also very interested in questions of audience and what audiences were doing with these images. My own background is in 19th century print culture and a lot of what I've looked at is questions of um, how do people take things that aren't perfect um, or how do they take things that are presented as perfect and remake them in some way, um, absorb them in some way, um, kind of make them their own, you might say. And as you acknowledge in your book, um, reception or how we take something in can really differ significantly from how something is produced and intended to go out and how it's disseminated. And it can be really hard to trace, as you acknowledge, how people read or view or listen to something that, um, and you say, quote, they made what they wanted of the books, pamphlets, and pictures given to them, often irrespective of the aims of the producers. So something is given to us, we're told how we're supposed to be received, to receive it, but we're pretty difficult creatures. Um, we find ways to misunderstand um, instructions. We find ways to really um, take our own will and put it on the, the text. And I just thought I would kind of um, add to the conversation a little bit by mentioning just a couple of examples um, that have been uh, looked at in terms of 19th century culture that might be connected to this. One of them um, is simply that uh, it's not a religious example, but it's from the period. And um, all of the examples actually are also published by Oxford, uh, which was the press for your book as well. But in her 1996 book, The Ad Man in the Parlor, which is about 19th century consumer culture, um, scholar Ellen Hoover Garvey, she looks at ways in which audiences in the 19th century played with early advertising images. And it's something that we might think it was, you know, maybe the consumer was getting overwhelmed at the time, being tricked in some way. Um, but she looked at things like scrapbooks and also periodicals, and she found evidence of people doing things like taking trading cards, making little collages, taking games, um, and playing games with these advertisements. And so the images that were given to them ended up being recreated in some way, ended up being subverted, they ended up subverting them in some way, and they ended up really playing with them in a lot of ways. Um, and so I think that's an interesting uh, kind of thing to keep in the back of our minds when we're looking at these images that are presented in such a kind of, you know, grand way. Um, and as in your book you argue, it's kind of moving toward maybe uh, a sense of piousness and devotion. Um, the other thing that I would bring up is more directly connected to religious culture. And it's from David Paul Nord's work um, on the efforts by 19th century call porters to really train American readers to read a certain way. 
and he looks at the very extensive efforts by the American Tract Society, the American Bible Society, who would send out workers into the field with the intent of distributing the kind of uh, massive amounts of religious literature, um, Bibles, tracts, and other things that were being produced at a kind of unforeseen rate in the 19th century. And Nord ends up looking at the records that the call porters had, and he documents that there was a really big gap between what the instructions that were given to readers, this is what you're supposed to do with this material, and what they actually did. Um, two chapters in his book, Faith and Reading. Um, the first one of them is entitled How Readers Should Read, and the second one is titled um, How Readers Did Read. And it was quite significantly different in a lot of ways. Um, the cult porters would be very frustrated. They would document things about, first of all, the lack of material that was out there, but then also things like um, that people said they had Bibles, and then they would go and look for them, and they would be covered with dust. So no matter how much they've been told how they were supposed to be reading these books, they clearly weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. Or people would say, yes, yes, I have a Bible, I have a Bible, and they would pull out books and it would be things like a history book. Um, it wouldn't at all be a Bible. So just bringing these examples um, up, I'm, I'm very interested in how it plays with, in your book there seems like a kind of top-down approach um, with Ellen and James White, uh, where they're very consciously maybe remaking the images to fit a certain kind of theology. And um, I, I, I'm, I know this will probably be a lot of additional research, or maybe it's come up in your, in your research since this time, but the degree to which there was any kind of conversation with audience, the people kind of pushing back at images that were out in circulation, and to the degree that people were, in fact, maybe engaged in a dialogue at all with them and, and were remaking those images. And my third point, just very briefly, is um, uh, Doug Morgan mentioned um, something that also intrigued me very much, which was the growing dominance of the cross by the time that you get to the final, um, to this third image by Thomas Moran. And certainly in comparison to the early chart where we saw it um, set out uh, as a very tiny, tiny image, um, it grows so much larger. And I sensed um, in your comments perhaps something that I felt too, which was maybe a, maybe a greater intrigue with what was going on in the Kellogg image uh, to begin with, that there's something very fascinating going on there with the interplay of the images. Um, and so one thing I was interested in is, is there seemed, um, and as I was thinking about the immigrant population during this time, an interesting intermixing possibly going on between Adventist culture and maybe um, Catholicism of the time. Um, a growing dominance of the, the image of the cross that you see uh, kind of um, throughout these images. And I know that your own work that you currently are working on and, and have a, a book coming out that is connected to the ways that Protestant and um, Catholic uh, images have um, intersected with each other, and so I hope that maybe at some point you'll get to say a few words to us about what, what you see, and maybe particularly in the 19th century in America if you've seen things like that. So thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank Professor Haas for inviting me here. I'm very happy to be here and see all these great people that I studied under, so thank you. The Adventism that hangs over my head is the Adventism of my early childhood. It is the stories of my grandfather, a Soviet pastor, resisting the government with smuggled scraps of scripture. It is the soft red exterior and the neat white windows of Zaksky Adventist Seminary. It is the evening tea that brought together Moscow intelligentsia and village peasants. It is the simple makeshift rooms where we practiced foot washing and the quaint illustrations of Uncle Arthur's bedtime stories. <laughs> this was the religious and cultural fabric of the Adventism that nurtured me. Through the interreligious dialogue and the political negotiations of my grandfather and father, it was a communal, anti-authoritarian, and action-oriented attitude. Like Christ and the early church, it was not naive to government persecution and criminality. And as far as the visual culture, it oscillated between the subtle artistry of the seminary's architecture or the modest communal makeshift rituals 
of small Russian churches. Since my late teens, I have struggled to relate the Adventism of my Russian family with the institutional Adventism I encountered in the United States. In my religious classes, in the sermons, in conversations with my peers, I encountered an Adventism which was rationalistic, doctrinal, and intellectually closed. I could not see the inner, experiential, and anti-authoritarian spirit of my upbringing in the abstract propositions of the 28 fundamental beliefs or the campaigns on Daniel and Revelation. The church leadership did not engage the American intelligentsia artists and scientists, but instead sought to discipline those who did not agree with official teachings. Most of all, it was difficult for me to relate to what Doug Morgan refers to as the doctrinal core of Adventism, a distinctive form of Christian millennialism, apocalypticism. Through my study of Roman Catholicism and my friendship with Catholic peers, I could not locate the ultimate locus of power and oppression in the Roman Catholic Church. Not only so, through its commitment to strict doctrinal conformity, the Adventism I knew began to resemble a power structure itself. The church meetings became business meetings, and the architecture of key buildings like the General Conference suggested the cold efficiency of a corporation. After reading David Morgan's analysis of Millerism and early Adventism in Protestant and pictures, I was transformed. The broader context of Adventism was illuminated. I understood that Adventism did not emerge in a vacuum, but developed from the material and intellectual culture of 19th century America. Not only so, I understood that Adventism was not static and univocal, but dynamic and complex. As Morgan eloquently argues, quote, the leaders of Millerism and Seventh-day Adventism, impelled by a deep sense of urgency, threw caution to the wind and indulged in the heady experience of liberty and egalitarianism that celebrated the disestablishment of religion and fired the Second Great Awakening. This egalitarian and liberative approach is most explicit in J.N. Lothborough's 1861 statement in the Review and Herald, quote, the first step of apostasy is to get up a creed telling us what we shall believe. The second is to make that creed a test of fellowship, end quote. Thus, I came to realize this doctrinal rigidity was not always endemic to Adventism. Furthermore, by situating Adventism in its historical context, I recognized its direct relevance and power. As David Morgan remarks, the intellectual assumptions of the time did not resemble the postmodern condition of today, but instead the reason, coherency, and certainty of the Enlightenment project. The charts were a response to that. Ronald Osborne also notes that the Roman Catholic Church did in fact behave in ways not far from beastly at the time. He points to Pope Gregory XVI and his encyclical Mirari Vos, where he condemned religious liberty, free speech, and the separation of church and state. This anti-Catholicism was not unique to Adventism, and Adventist suspicions of church-state coalition were not unwarranted. In the 1890s, dozens of Adventists were jailed for worshiping on Saturday and plying their fields on Sunday because of the blue laws of their Christian nation. Through this history, I understood that the Adventist concern with Roman Catholicism and the government had much more to do with power and oppression than it did with Roman Catholicism as a tradition, per se. In regards to a fixed univocal Adventism, Adventism's ability to adapt visually is most explicit in the shift from schematism to pictorialism. Morgan notes how the shift from prophetic charts to Sabbatarian devotional imagery was really a turn away from the law-oriented Enlightenment paradigm of Uriah Smith to the new grace-centered inner spirituality of White. This historical analysis forever dispelled the illusion 
of a pure, objective, fixed, and univocal Adventism. And I felt that Morgan's study of Adventist visual culture may help us understand why Adventism endured. It directly engaged the changing realities. Today, the U.S. directs military deployments in 150 countries with 1,000 100,000, 72,000 active duty personnel. By strongly supporting tyrannical states like the Saudi royal family, it robs Saudi citizens of basic freedom and refuses to participate in the international criminal court. Domestically, as documented in Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, the United States holds the highest incarceration rate, 2.3 million prisoners with blacks and Hispanics accounting for 60% of the inmates. American racism still functions, but in a more hidden, systemic way. And in regards to carbon emission, temperatures are projected to rise 11 degrees within the next 90 years. Furthermore, Ronald Osborne demonstrates that unlike the 19th century, since Vatican II, Catholicism has been a leader of religious liberty and is severely weakened by Protestantism. After the horrors of Zyklon B and the atom bomb, the Enlightenment ideal for reason, objectivity, and coherency has been challenged by sociologists, continental philosophers, and quantum physicists. The absolute claims and schemas of the 19th century do not appeal to the postmodern mind. Thus, a sober reckoning of the 21st century reality demonstrates that Adventism has lost the very engaged and creative spirit that mothered it. I must agree with Doug Morgan. If anything is to define early Adventism, it is apocalyptic. However, it is an apocalypticism that is spiritually perceptive, prophetically imaginative, and anti-authoritarian. Today, art presents itself as one of the most powerful resources for transformation and regeneration of a new, sustainable religious and cultural fabric. The relevant theopolitical prophetic imagination of early Adventism may be reignited to address the principalities and powers like the U.S. military industrial complex, the prison industrial complex just mentioned, and the multinational corporate capitalist machine. It is here that powerful biblical symbols may continue to move us according to our spiritual perceptiveness. Like the early pioneers, here, we may return to the subversive images of the beast and kind of get to what Professor Douglas Morgan was talking about, getting back into the narrative. Furthermore, White's shift from schematism to pictorialism for devotional piety may also be instructive. Since the introduction of the 28 fundamental beliefs as well as the turn towards conservatism, the commitment to devotional piety through quality fine art has waned. White's 1881 commission of the nationally renowned landscape painter and illustrator Thomas Moran should serve as an important example of the church engaging with art, fine art, at its best. It is not by chance that Moran's work, The Three Tetons, is hanging in the White House. Today, to hire someone of the prominence of Moran would be to hire Christian Furr, maybe someone no less famous in the art world than Jasper Johns. However, Ellen G. White also cautioned against trivial art that did not lead towards spiritual truth. This commitment to socio-politically engage art must be applied to the predominant Eurocentrism of the church. Although ultimately divinity transcends race and gender, operationally Adventist visual culture is still Eurocentric, patriarchal, and anthropocentric. With the heritage of dualistic enlightenment assumptions, it visually rejects Afrocentrism, femininity, and the sanctity of nature. If people of color are pictured, their unique spiritual or cultural heritage is stripped away to fit Western Judeo-Christian visual standards. Through the black liberation theology of my mentor, Professor James Cone, the church may align itself with the oppressed, 
It may turn to the symbol of blackness, where God has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lonely. More specifically, a new visual culture may emerge to address the reality of structural racism and Eurocentrism by depicting Christ as a person of color, a Palestinian peasant Jew with darker skin and wool hair, the church may practice solidarity with the oppressed. It is my contention that like many religions in the West, Adventism, as, as it is promulgated in its current beliefs and practices, is in deep crisis, a sort of spiritual impotence that does not directly engage the pressing political, social, scientific, and intellectual realities of today. However, it is in times like these that I'm reminded of Christ's followers walking somberly to Emmaus, or Hiram Edson walking through the grain field in Port Gibson, New York. It is in the commitment to hope within hopelessness that the Holy Spirit emerges. Then, when it does emerge, it is not a question of tradition or doctrinal conformity, but an openness to the living God, however he or she reveals herself. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the two responses I really did. Wonderful points, and I think you feel very welcome, and I sincerely appreciate it. Did you go to the University of Chicago? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> My, our, we have a, 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 a joint teacher, a fellow teacher, Martin Marty, who one of the first times I saw him uh, in class, he, he did this wonderful thing. He came up to me. He'd heard, I talked to him once. I told him what I was interested in. He handed me a book. He says, I think you're going to get a lot more out of this than I would, than I do. And I, I, he says, and I autographed it. Hi. Wow. So I opened it up and said, to Doug Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we can share this uh, mutual uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I, I love what you said, and um, some of that comes uh, to, to the, the demographics, the immigration, uh, the cat, and Catholicism comes in the uh, first couple chapters where I deal with the American Chinese society, but I, I think you're right on target. It's very good. I mean, we could talk more about this stuff, and I, I love both of what you were talking about, and all three of you actually, the, the subversiveness of the tradition, and, and, and in fact, it, uh, this image provided something powerful and important, but also may have closed certain doors. It would be really interesting. You know more about this than I do, but I think that's a great topic, and art is uh, wonderful precisely because of its uh, sophistication and dualism. And I was uh, delighted with what you said. I, I think you're, uh, you know, and you're, you're, you're perhaps the best testament that the activist tradition is not done, uh, that it's got a future, and that it's passionate, and uh, resourceful and creative, and uh, I can't imagine a better way to, to end this uh, conversation from my point of view. So thank you. Thank you.